I'm Neil Mackay and I've been a crime reporter for over 20 years. I've often found myself in some very dangerous and tricky situations in search of the truth. And I suppose for most journalists that's an accepted occupational hazard. But I'm intrigued to know what makes crime reporters tick. What character traits are needed before a person can really delve into the darkest side of humanity. In today's Covering Crime, I'm joined by Paul Pender to hear about his terrifying encounter with Archibald Hall. Paul had no idea of the dangers he would face when he chose to write about this infamous serial killer, known as the Monster Butler. Hi Paul, thanks for joining me all the way from sunny Santa Monica in California today. Now, to me this really is a remarkable story. It's a crime reporter's dream come true to have a serial killer write to you from jail and say, I'll give you my entire life story, warts and all. Did you really appreciate just how big a scoop had landed in your lap? Yes, I did realise I was I had hit pay dot, as it were, when uh, he actually called me from prison and uh, I had just written a TV movie called The Bogeyman, starring Craig Ferguson and Robbie Coltrane. And one day I got this bizarre phone call from a, a man with a very posh voice saying, uh, may I speak to Paul Pender, please? And I, and I said, this is Paul Pender. And instantly his accent went all uh, Glaswegian on me and said, I knew you were a Glasgow boy, son. You're the boy to write my story. My name's Roy Fontaine. I'm, I'm pleasuring Her Majesty at the moment. And I said, excuse me? And he said, I'm, I'm detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. And uh, he then went on to tell me he was a jewel thief and a charismatic con artist and made himself sound fascinating, and uh, but he neglected one tiny detail that he'd brutally murdered five people. But that, of course, made him more interesting, not less. So I thought this is a fascinating story, potentially, and I could explore the nature of evil, which is a subject of great interest to me, and do something that was, could yeah. be riveting television. Now, you refer to him there as Roy Fontaine, but I reckon most probably know him better as Archibald Hall because that's how he's knowing to history. Otherwise, you know, his, his moniker was also the, the monster butler. Could you maybe tell us a wee bit about this character? Because to me, he's an intriguing criminal. He's a serial killer who, who becomes a serial killer late in life for a start, which is really, really unusual. So could you maybe just recount some of this character's crimes for listeners who might not be au fait with his past? This was a working class boy from Govan in Glasgow, born in 1924, who dreamt of uh, wider horizons than the ones that were on offer to him. He was a very clever man, a very clever boy, and very charming and very charismatic. I knew that from the first moment he spoke to me. He was very erudite. We used to talk about books when I got to meet him. He'd started out as a jewel thief and con artist. And he used to, he decided that the best way to commit his crimes would be to forge his own references as a butler, which he did very successfully. And he had the uh, panache to carry it off. So he used to steal jewels from his employers and replace them with glass imitations. But at the age of 53, something in him snapped. And I believe it was the fact that his mother died when he was in prison on a jewel thief charge. And, um, and they wouldn't release him from prison without being manacled to a prison officer. And at that point, I think he turned to the dark side. And from the age of 53 to in the next three years, he killed five people, including his girlfriend, his boyfriend, he was bisexual, a Tory cabinet minister and his wife, and his brother, in an orgy of violence and that, that took him from London to uh, up to uh, Perthshire. So, I mean, usually serial killers, you know, display uh, cruelty to animals when they're kids. They, they have a serial killer gene, if you will, but something in him changed when he was 53, and at the exact moment his mother died, I think she was his moral compass, the only person he ever truly loved, and uh, she was a, a woman who wanted to be an artist, who had big dreams and filled his head full of dreams and said he should never work under the ships and govern, he should be on the ships, on those cruise liners, and um, so he kind of realised uh, her ambitions for him, but not quite in the way she had envisaged. Yeah, he got said. infamous, not famous. He got infamous, but he was a very funny guy. You know, it was for me the fascination from the get go was the the charisma of evil. You know, the charm, the way that he had successfully conned very important people for twenty years. That he was a man of breeding and sophistication, and you know, he'd learned all about butling from books in prison, basically, and he knew about fine wines from from books. He he was a completely self taught man and a completely reinvented man. And up till he started killing people, he did some very funny scams, including disguising himself as a, a sheik and uh, stealing lots of jewellery from the Dorchester Hotel. Charm and charisma seem to me to be key 
weapons in this guy's arsenal as a serial killer. This is part of his... Yes. It forms part of the kind of modus operandi, doesn't it? He lures people in with his, you know, his wonderful etiquette and his delightful knowledge of fine wines and excellent cigars. But, you know, there was a really dark side as well to your relationship with him because it turned quite nasty, didn't it? I'm just curious, would, mm. would you have even began this relationship if you knew where it was going to go? No, probably I wouldn't because it has to be said that uh, everything was going swimmingly at first, but he did insist from the very beginning that I smuggle him in cash and cigarette packets. Which is illegal, yeah. had, Which is illegal, yeah. I think, I'm, am I confessing to a crime on air here? I think, think you are, can, yeah. I think, I think there's a statute of limitation. You At probably get picked up the... by the California Highway Patrol when you leave the studios over oh, in America. Oh, God, I know. I'll, be t- I'll have to go in disguise. But uh, I was never comfortable doing that, but I thought if that's the price you pay for this great story, so be it. But about four or five meetings in, I started to have second thoughts because I realised he was turning me into his accomplice. Now, a key thing we need to, to tell listeners at home is that unlike my other guests on covering crime, you're not a crime reporter by trade, you're a Hollywood scriptwriter. Kind of interesting that you're using almost the language of journalism there, that, you know, sometimes journalists do things that we aren't really that proud of in, other, in order to get a story. But tell me a wee bit about that, that yeah, um, my... bargain with your conscience you made. Well, it was, I suppose, a bargain, a Faustian pact, if you like. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd always been interested in, in true stories. And the movie that that, I, that got me over here was a movie called Evelyn, which was a true story of a little girl whose father fights to get her out of an orphanage in 1950s yeah, Ireland. And um, a great story is a great story. And I wasn't particularly bothered about what genre it was in. I, I also liked doing comedy, but from the, the word go, I thought this guy was funny. So uh, I, I, I was troubled, I have to say, throughout by the morality of what I was doing. I was conscious that he was kind of luring me into a web to make him look good. He said that there'd been a, there'd been a couple of journalistic accounts of his life before I arrived on the scene, because he'd been in prison since 1978, and he was the longest-serving prisoner in, in a British prison, actually, when he died. I thought, is he, is he trying to lure me in to make him look good? And I vowed that I would give an honest account of his, of his life. But as it went on, I thought, he spends his life corrupting people, and now he's corrupting me. I'm just well, what becoming... What was he doing to corrupt you? Okay, you were, you were bringing him in money and cigars, mm-hmm. and that's bad and naughty, and yeah. you shouldn't have done it, but, you know. Mm-hmm. But when, what was he doing? Was he, how was he getting into your mind, is what I'm interested in? Well, he was flattering me. He was saying we were cut from the same cloth. A, we both lied for a living. Uh, you know, he said, right. <laughs> That's a good definition of <laughs> writing. Excellent. Exactly. And then he would quote, you know, he had great quotes that uh, Picasso had said, you know, art is nothing but a beautiful lie. And I'd, I'd written a TV show called Beautiful Lies about H.G. Wells and George Orwell. And interestingly, many of my heroes as writers were also journalists, so I always had a journalistic dimension, even though mm-hmm. I was a screenwriter. And I, I've also been fascinated for a long time by the question of evil. What, what is evil and how do you combat it? And I'd spent a miserable time in London in my youth trying to write a, a fun book about the rise of the Nazi party and wondering how Hitler had seduced the German people because he was democratically elected. And the answer, again, was the the charm and the charisma of evil. So it raised an awful lot of issues that fascinated me. But yes, I think initially, up till he started telling me about the killings themselves, and don't forget that was about five meetings in, it just seemed, he seemed like a lovable rogue, you know, a Robin Hood figure who had uh, beat the odds, he'd born on the wrong side of the tracks, and he only stole from rich people. Yes. Uh, absolutely an intriguing figure. And it came across very strongly when I read about him when I was younger that that indeed it was this, he had this deadly charm, this deadly charisma. And, and I wonder to some extent, forgive the use of the word, I mean, the word has been changed now a lot in its sense because of some of the bigger scandals that we've had, but do you think he was grooming you in a way? That's a very good way to put it, yes. That's a term that's become current since I met him, really. But yes, in many ways he was. He was, uh, A, he was bisexual. He was very well trained in the way of grooming young men. And he was a very flirtatious uh, relationship with me. I was younger and better looking in those days. I can say that on radio. So do you think he was but sexually attracted it... to you? <laughs> well, I no, think no, he I mean, was sexually attracted. No, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, I'm really curious because no, I think it might a, be a key a very... to your relationship with him. I think it's a very valid question. I think... Um, Prob- I think he was sexually attracted to, if you were a young male with a pulse, he was probably sexually attracted to you. So I ticked those boxes. But yeah, probably because I, um, 
you know, I, I was from the same part of the world as him. I'd read many of the same books. We liked the same authors. Were you aware that you were flirting with something quite dangerous? Well, I'll tell you the first indication I had of it, which is quite comical in, in retrospect, is that the bogeyman, which is the thing he'd seen, got its first and only bad review from by a Scottish TV journalist. And I get a call at the BBC from Roy saying she would not be the TV critic for much longer. He was going to have her taken care of. But he's locked up in clink. How can he kill someone? When a scar-faced henchman appeared on my doorstep one day with flowers and... And, and fruit, I realised he had many henchmen on the outside who were very well prepared to do his bidding. So I, I thought that Scarface was going to take care of the, uh, the TV critic. And that was the first indication, because I was genuinely worried about it. This guy had nothing to lose. He was never going to be released from prison. And he said, if she's criticising you, son, she's criticising me. In many and he ways, sent you flowers and chocolates or something. What was it? Uh, flowers and fruit, yes. Tasteful and touching. But he, he, he was conscious of his... Uh, well, no, I don't think so. I think what he was trying to do was he wanted somebody to write a book about him that would portray him not totally as the monster butler, mm. as a monster butler, but a, a, give a round... He hated the name the monster butler, of course. I'm sure uh, he did, he but then he shouldn't have killed five people and he wouldn't have had he shouldn't. I know, that's, I, I kept raising that point. You know, I kept saying, that's, you know, really, you're not in here because you were a con man. You're here because you killed five people. Mm -hmm. But I, I think he thought that there, there should be a a more even-handed, more more of an inside track picture of this guy, and it should be funny. So as part well. of this wooing exercise from him to you was to kind of massage you into being the writer he wanted you to be. Is that what you say? That would exactly, be fair? exactly, yes. Then did you fall? It's good talking to, talking to you about it. Gives me a more objective view of what was actually going on. It's fascinating. Yes. Up till I, the worm turned and I said it's over. I'm not continuing with the project. I, I've decided that you're basically evil and at that point he picked up the pencil I was I had with me and threatened to ram it through my eye unless I come back in a couple of weeks with So how did you go money. from being wooed and charmed by Archibald Hall to being ready to be victim number six what how did the relationship degenerate so badly I think by me standing up to him and basically delivering some of the home truths that you're touching on saying I said to him you're just trying to get me to prettify your story, to put icing on the maggot-ridden cake of your life, and I'm not your stooge. I wanted to write an honest view of it, and uh, I'm not liking the way you're bullying me into bringing you money, so I'm not doing it anymore. And at that point, he threatened to have me killed, and then literally by the time I got home, there was a death threat on my home telephone answering machine. So Very I, frightening. How did you feel? Very frightened. There was a several months where I lived in a state of abject terror I changed my appearance and I was still working at the BBC uh, obviously it put me in a, a delicate position because um, I thought it would escalate if I made it public and uh, and maybe it would just go away you know maybe the storm would pass which eventually it did because he was nuts and he flipped back again every week <clears throat> I would get a little message on my answering machine saying you're dead pender and the, the occasional card saying, you, uh, usually your dead pender was the, 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 the key phrase. Just suddenly as it started, he, he then left a message saying he was sorry because he'd, his mother had come to him in a vision and told him they had to apologise and that I had been selected by destiny to write his story and would, would, would I please go back for one final meeting and we'd finish the story and be friends for life. And as in, I think I should say this in my defence, as it were, was the fact that he was a kind of... He travelled through the British class system effortlessly, it seemed, and had a fascinating commentary on it because he had moved, literally, you know, he'd moved in royal circles, he'd moved in very elite circles and very gay circles, very bisexual circles. So this was a, this was not the normal career path for a guy who, who was expected to work in the governed shipyards. And it made him a fascinating creation. And for me as a writer, that was you know, too much to resist. It's She's quite interesting then that when he falls out with you, he falls uh -huh. out with you when you challenge him. You know, obviously, I think we've all been schooled enough to know that serial killing isn't just about killing, it's about power and control. Yeah. So he falls out with you when you challenge or undermine his dominant personality. Yes, I don't think he was used to that. I mean, that was a very unusual experience uh, for him to have. And uh, I think eventually he came to kind of admire that and thought, well, this guy isn't going to come back and 
bring me money again. I never did. You know, I said the deal so is... So was just standing up to the bully in the playground, hit him back and then that's it, over and done with kind of thing? Yes, only when the bully in the playground's killed five people and has nothing to lose, it does add an extra frisson to the... Yeah, and I wonder yeah. if you would if you were unfortunate enough to, say, be another prisoner in whatever jail he was in, would it have been yes. as easy to stand up to him if you're locked on a cell block? What, you know, I wouldn't have thought so, no. Even being, you know, hundreds of miles away didn't give me a very great sense of security. It was a wake-up call for me. I suddenly thought, you know, I've been living this kind of bourgeois fantasy that he's just a lovable rogue, but he's an evil, manipulative man who gives not a jot for human life. So. Interesting you use the word bourgeois fantasy there because I suppose there is a frisson of, you know, putting your toe in the waters of the demimonde, you know, going to the, a little voyeuristic tour yes. of the dark side. So I think that's quite brave of you saying that there was an element of that b bourgeois fantasy about Absol it. Well, absolutely. I always remember I would get the train back from Full Sutton and I would be thinking, I'd be looking at the kind of bored commuters and I would think, uh, I've just been hanging out with a serial killer. How's your day been? You know, I thought it was cool, but now I don't, you know. Now I think it was kind of pathetic. But, uh, you know, I, I still have ambivalent feelings about my own involvement in the in the whole affair, but I, I'm retrospectively glad it all happened. But there is an element of being a crime reporter. I mean, I've spent lots of times with people who have done disgusted and depraved crimes, but when you're with them in the moment, they're yes. simply another human being, and unless you kind of empathise with them as a human being and take them for, you know, that they, that they can be a, a father in the afternoon and they can go shopping with their wife in the evening, but they might kill someone you know, the next day. Un un unless you're able to look at someone in a 360 way, I don't think you're ever going to be able to tell a story about them. You know, a lot of my Agreed. reporting was about the troubles in Northern Ireland, and I spent a lot of time with paramilitaries, and one of the things I always wanted to do was get behind the gunman and find out who's the father, who's the, you know, who's the son, that kind of stuff. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think you very eloquently summed up my motivation for writing the book, and why but I there is a bargain the... that you play with yourself at the same time, because you will come away yes. and feel... Oh my God, I just spent, you know, three or four hours in the company of a murderer and I laughed at their jokes. I know, and you feel tainted. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you don't try and get under their skin, you will end up with a cardboard cutout. You won't have something that lives. And all the great writing comes from, from getting under the skin. And, you know, Tolstoy said you have to treat every character, even your most evil character, with sympathy if you want to do writing, write something that lasts. So that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. And I take it if and, your book uh, took off and was turned into a film, someone would play you as the character because you're obviously the protagonist, it, aren't you? It's a, it's a challenge to get anybody with a husky enough voice and obviously, you know, <laughs> anybody say... Yeah, I would love to say that James McAvoy would someday... Or David Tennant, but to me, James McAvoy would be the ideal ingenue, you know, who's the kind of trusting BBC script editor. Well, again, is that what Alan you were? Cameron I mean, let's be kid. honest. Were you a trusting ingenue or were you a guy in the make going, hang on, I could make a load of dollars out of this guy? Both, I think, is the honest answer. Yes, it's true. I mean, I, one has to. I mean, my job was to have a nose for a good story, and the fact that this guy wanted me to write it was a was I thought a godsend. So yes, I, I wasn't a, a, an ingenue as such, but I, I had elements of that. And uh, but you're also a, a lad with an eye to the main chance too. I was an, a lad with, with looking for a, a passport to Hollywood and. And the end, I chose the little Irish girl on the grounds that she would, she was much much less likely to nail my head to the floor, or have one of her friends do so. So um, I never forgot my promise to Roy. You see, at my last meeting, I promised him. He said, "Well, you, you promise you will write something about me, even even if I'm dead." And I and I and he get quite tearful. And I said, "Yes, I promise I will. I can't say when." And when he dropped off his perch, I finally I felt guilty, and he kind of haunted me for a couple of years. I kept thinking, you know. Now's the time I should do this, and uh, and eventually I did. You wrote your book, The Butler Did It, a long time after Archibald Hall died. Is that because you were scared of how he would receive it? That you had some kind of concerns about your your personal safety, given he had this uh, this reach beyond prison? Yes, frankly, I think it was. I think I was uh, both relieved and saddened when I heard of his death, but. Uh, it was kind of the green light for me to revisit the project, which up to, which was existing as a as a series of papers in a, a cardboard box in my cupboard in my office in Santa Monica. But yes, I would have been worried, given his instability, that no matter how sympathetic a portrait I had written, 
I would have tried to write an honest one, but if, if he'd regarded it as uh, unsympathetic, that he was so well connected, I'm sure he could have had some scar faced accomplice pounding the golden streets of uh, Santa Monica, mm. come and visit me, because he had an enormous uh, reach for a man who'd spent a lot of his life sitting, looking at the same four walls. Well, let's go back to you saying that you were an ingenue, because initially when we were talking, I was thinking to myself, my God, you know, Paul Pender's been the play thing of a serial killer. How You know, it's almost this Hannibal Lecter, Clary Starling uh -huh. thing where you come into prison and yes. he's manipulating you. But, th but then you've admitted that you, can't, you knew you were being played, you knew he was flirting with you, you knew he had maybe some kind of sexual attraction for you, you knew that you were do doing a little pact with the devil to get your story out of him. So was he your play thing too? Yes, I'd like to think so, because that empowers me. And I mean, it was, um, I like to think of it as the irresistible force and the immovable object. And But I think he was kind of, I also like to think he was testing me to see if I really was destined to write his story, I would have to be strong-willed because, don't forget, nobody commissioned this thing. I mean, I wrote it in spec in the end. You know, we cancelled the whole BBC thing. And... Uh, and I filed it as a future project. So, yes, I think we were manipulating each other. And I hope one of the fascinations of the book is the uh, locking of horns and uh, the sparring between us as we, as, we, as we fight for ascendancy. You were locking horns. There was a battle of wills. Who was ultimately coming out and talking? I mean, did you ever have a chance of beating this guy? Because this is a serial killer who, you know, his life is about power and control. You're a young writer uh, on his way up. Did you ever have a chance of actually mentally beaten this fella? No, I don't think I had the chance of beating him until he actually died. I think that was uh, that was my get out of jail card, as it were. I think everything was on hold until then. We ended up friends, for want of a better word. We'd send each other Christmas cards. And just before he died, I sent him a card announcing that Evelyn was about to be released. And about two weeks after that, he died. And. Uh, and I suppose then I thought, OK, well, now I have the freedom to explore this fascinating character because there were so many unanswered questions for me. It wasn't that I had reached any great conclusions about, you know, my own involvement and uh, m the fact that I was morally compromised or otherwise. So writing the book was a kind of therapy for me. Mm -hmm. And also I thought there was a supreme irony that I'd always wanted to write books and I'm currently writing more of them. And I thought it was great that... Uh, this guy, this unlikely character, this fascinating, unlikely serial killing character, gave me a, a new aspect to my career, you know, as a book writer. Really interesting you called him your friend there, because I think that that yeah. it's very honest of you, it's very telling. Before the Lockerbie bomber died, I used to get Christmas cards from him. Really? And my, my, uh. my, my close family, you know, thought how strange and icky and odd we had formed a man-to-man a -man relationship through me reporting on a story to some extent. And it is strange to say that these notorious figures have to, that you have a friendship with them, isn't it? It, it is indeed. It's interesting that the other people who wrote books about him felt that they'd become his friend. Uh, I mean, he had a gift for uh, intimacy, bogus or otherwise, for mm -hmm. making you feel that, you know, you are important to his life and you know, for all I know, he could have been pretending that his mother had come to him in a dream and said, I was destined to write his story. But uh, but I bought into it. And I, as I say in the book, when when I, the day I found out he died, I felt sad, which was not what I expected to feel. I thought I would feel relieved, but I felt sad. And I thought, oh, that's a shame. I miss those conversations. That was an ex exhilarating time. So why did it take away. you so long to write the book? Did you need breathing space after his death? I to needed yeah, distance, absolutely, yes. I needed to try and get perspective on it, and Indeed. distance lens, enchantment and all that. And in a funny way, you know, and also I started feeling a bit homesick. And you're writing about a Scottish serial killer was the closest I got to a Scottish theme, uh, bizarrely enough. But it meant I could rethink about Glasgow again and London and, you know... Dear that is blighty. the most curious form of dealing with homesickness I've ever heard. <laughs> well, I like to be original. Yeah, you know that, well, Neil. certainly one off that. So, Paul, you you must look back now and think to yourself, there's a lesson to be learned about Paul Pender here as well. You you, you must have realised that you need a certain psyche, some some special set of traits or skills to take on a project which involves, in effect, being a crime reporter. 
befriending a serial killer, getting inside their head, and to some extent empathising. What, yes. what do you think this story has told you about your own psychology? Um, well, what it told me about myself is that I am fascinated by extraordinary characters, and uh, it taught me that I am easily flattered, which uh, you know, an aspect of myself I don't like to acknowledge, but. But I, at least I, I saw through that, you know, the flattery that he was, he, the stuff he was feeding me to flatter my vanity. But I think it's, uh, on the positive side, I think it shows a steely determination not to give up on a project and to um, finally realise that the dream of every Hollywood hack to write a decent book. And uh, just to try to empathise with that. Uh, with my fellow human beings and find echoes in people's experience. So hopefully anyone who reads the book will will form a strong view of, of me as well as him. I'm interested to know now that the experience is over, let's say you got a letter today from someone like Rosie West and she said, yeah. Paul Pender, I've read your stuff, love it. Why don't you come into uh, prison and uh, I'll give you my story warts and all. Knowing what you know about your experience of Archie Hall, would you do it? I don't think so. I don't think what attracted me to... No, I, I think I could say no because that's just unrelieved cruelty, evil, sadism. Whereas the Roy story was so much more. It was a journey through the class system of which we are all beneficiaries and or victims. And that was what appealed to me. It was a social satire element. You don't get that in the your average c serial killer. What I loved about the Roy project is that he was so different from the norm, whereas your, um, you know, your Dennis Nielsen's or your Rosie Wests are just your common or garden killers, and uh, and that Roy said that as well because I think Dennis Nielsen ended up in the same prison, and he had a certain contempt for your common or garden killer. He thought he was so much more, and he thought my book would protect his legacy and show that he was so much more. So. This yes, guy I'm wanted in royalty, really, didn't he? I mean, yes, he did. Well, Roy, he, he liked Roy because it also meant the king in French, and he was a <laughs> thought it was a very French name, Roy Fontaine, Le Roy, and uh, oh no, he was quite uh, French, but also really cheesy. There's a certain, there's, <laughs> but that's know. that's that's Glasgow for you. I don't know. <laughs> Only Glasgow is. could rename Cleopatra's Clatty Pats. Absolutely, Paul Pender. Hollywood scriptwriter and accidental crime reporter, thank you very much for sharing the story with us here today on covering crime of what I think is a really remarkable and both chilling relationship with Archibald Hall, the notorious serial killer known to posterity as the Monster Butler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. It was great. Thanks. Thanks.